you are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. It's Georgia week. You know, that Georgia team that everyone thinks is going to make the college football playoff, number two team in the country, college game day, going there, all that fun stuff. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's happening this weekend in Athens. I can't wait to make the trip. Um, I'm going down to Athens for the first time, and so it should be pretty fun to see how all that plays out. But anyways, uh, it's fun. And so we're going to have Logan Booker of 960 The Ref joining us on the other side of the break as uh, he's one of the great radio guys out of Athens and talks – uh, a lot about Georgia and is a Georgia grad and a Georgia fan, kind of like me. So lots in common. We're going to talk to him uh, more about Georgia on the other side of the break. But uh, I did want to open up this podcast in discussing something that I have really noticed from not only national college football media, but also some people even in local media. And with Arkansas being as good as they are right now and being a top 10 team and having quality wins and looking good doing it and all of that, I I don't think people really know what to do. I don't think that people really know what to make out of all of this. I really don't. You know, I've seen guys at Texas that when Arkansas beat them, that it was like, oh, well, that was just a fluke game. Uh, you know, they didn't really do anything to stop us. It was more we beat ourselves. You know, they didn't do anything special. We just beat ourselves. And then you hear like Texas A&M and like Isaiah Spiller saying kind of something similar. Well, no, they didn't stop us. We beat ourselves and it has nothing to do with what they did. It had to do with what we didn't do and all of that. And I'm starting to realize why that is and why that is the case. It's because when these people's mindsets – they can't wrap their head around the fact that Arkansas football is actually good. And they're actually good this quick. They can't wrap their minds around that. Because when they go into a season saying, okay, this is the team that went that won three games last year. Uh, and they have Sam Pittman, who's still not, you know, he's not a veteran head coach. You know, they hadn't won a conference game in two years prior to that. They, they're just been a bottom dweller of the SEC West. You know, there's just no way that this team is actually good. Well, now that they're actually good and this quick, it's like, okay, well, it has to be something else. It has to be that they just, you know, got lucky. They got lucky or we just played terribly. It can't be that Arkansas football is actually good because they're not good. I mean, look at them. They're, they're Arkansas. They don't have any NFL players on that team. They, they got a new quarterback that... It's just, no, 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 no. They're just, they're just not good. They're just not good. We just play bad. People don't know what to do. <laughs> people don't know what to think about Arkansas right now. And even people in the national media, which of course you've gotten that top eight ranking and, you know, people obviously believe in a lot in you, but there's still some people that are just saying like, there's just no way. There's just no way this is happening. Like, you know, you see they, cause they see teams and, be, uh, coaches that have been that got hired around the same time Sam Pittman did. They see like Mike Norvell at Florida State, and they're like, "Well, that was a great hire at the time, and they was really going to bring him back." And now they're god awful, and they're like, "What? Well, okay." But then they see Mike Leach at Mississippi State. They're like, "Oh man, the, the pirate is coming into the SEC. He's going to turn this this thing around and go crazy with it." Well, he's actually not very good, and he's not doing very good in the second year. I'm just like, "Whoa, okay." They see Eli Drinkwitz at Missouri he had a solid first year, but then this year having some bad losses already. And everyone's like, "Well, I don't." I mean, there's there's probably a reason for that. It's just it's 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 got to be something. Like people give excuses and give reasons for that, and they can't again wrap their head around the fact that Arkansas and Sam Pittman is this good in year two. Because he was, you could depending on who you looked at and who you listened to, he was the worst Power Five college football hire of the time, and now he's looking like the best. And we'll see between him and Lane Kiffin, because some people may give it to Lane. But as of right now, Sam Pittman is the best of those hires. And since we live in a society where people are just so unwilling to ever admit that they were wrong, they start trying to find reasons. And that's what they're struggling with right now. And I love it. I love the fact that they are just so confused by it all. 
So Arkansas has got a lot of work to do, continuing to do at least. They still got a eight game schedule left. Uh, still got conference play. Still got all of that, and it's not going to be easy. And I'm fully expecting them to lose some games. I think we all are, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think I can ever, I have ever seen at least anything or anybody have such an issue with what's going on at Arkansas. Sam Pittman has done something that I don't think anyone thought was possible. And now that he's adding on to that thing where everyone thought it was impossible and he's doing it with players that, you know, a lot of people didn't really respect or didn't count on or anything like that. He's got it going so well right now that people are rooting for him because they're kind of Arkansas is kind of like the the darling of college football. You got a fun head coach and Sam Pittman. You got a he's a humble guy. You got a team that plays really hard that doesn't have a bunch of five stars surrounding the team. They just a bunch of kids that just really play hard. And a lot of them being from the state of Arkansas and you know, they don't, they don't chirp. They don't talk trash. They don't do any of that. They just go out and play. I mean, this is, this is what people want. This is what, who people want to root for. And I think that the way it's going right now, it's pretty exciting. I can't wait for Athens. And the thing is, is that I don't know if Arkansas, if Arkansas beats George, I don't know what I'm going to do. I honestly don't know what I'm going to do down in Athens. I probably may not make it back. Like, I may get arrested for public indecent exposure or whatever for streaking down the field. I don't know. Something's going to happen, but it's <laughs> it's Saturday, and we got to wait on it. We got to see how it goes, but man, what a time to be a Razorback fan. We'll talk with Logan Booker here in just a second. First, got to tell you about betonline.ag. It's back and better than ever, and all eyes are on football right now. So as always, BetOnline is your number one spot for the pro and college football action this season. With a new updated site and, and interface, even more odds, props, and contests, betonline.ag continues to be the number one source for all things football. So head to the website or use your mobile device today and sign up today, and you will receive a 100% welcome bonus on your first deposit using promo code Locked On at betonline.ag, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your four favorite sports and your online sportsbook experts at betonline.ag. Locked on Razorbacks, your daily Arkansas Razorbacks podcast. All right, right now let's go to the phone lines. We are joined by Logan Booker of 960 The Ref. Talk a little Arkansas and Georgia this upcoming weekend in Athens. Always going to be a fun time talking with my guy, Logan. Logan, appreciate you joining us this afternoon, man. How you doing? John, it's always a pleasure joining you. I hope you guys are doing well. And man, I cannot wait. For Saturday at noon. Heck, Saturday at 9 a.m. when college game day cranks up like you were just talking about, man. This is all of a sudden a pretty darn big week, isn't it? Yeah, it's funny. I'm sure that before the season started, you circled that Arkansas game and said, you know what, that when jo- when Arkansas or when Georgia's going to get college game day at home, it's going to be against the Arkansas Razorbacks. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, it's funny you say that. I, I literally, I had this conversation on my show this week, and I reminded folks that Back in the summertime when every one of us, myself and you guys out there in Little Rock and everywhere around the SEC, we just hold on to those helmet schedules and we we pour over those things. And I remember specifically having a conversation with our listeners one morning that, yeah, I would not bet anything that you're going to see college game day in Athens this year. The the Georgia home schedule on paper back in July uh, and August really didn't look that great. I mean, it's it's cool to have Arkansas coming in for the first time since 2010. I don't mean that as any disrespect to, to Arkansas at all, but nothing about that back in the summer screen top 10 matchup at all. I texted you a couple days ago, John. I was like, man, when you and I were talking at SEC Media Days, yeah, why did we not talk about college game day coming to Athens October 2nd? So th- this is all of a sudden a really, really good fun story around not just the SEC, but college football, what Arkansas is putting together. And I'm having a blast right now. And I'm telling you right now, the people in Athens are as fired up right now for a home game as I've seen them in quite some time. Uh, You may have to go back to Notre Dame coming to Athens in in 2019. Uh, That's all this town is talking about is this top 10 matchup this week. And we are fired up to host you guys. And I think it's going to be awesome, man. This, This week can't get over with fast enough. Logan, so much is made about the noon kickoffs and 11 a.m. Central. How do you feel about those early games, the early kickoffs, and how do the Georgia fans in general feel about those kickoffs? So, in general, it, it's a cuss word. I, I can't say that on the radio without getting some backlash. Noon kickoff, it feels like you got to hit the dump button when you say it, man. But uh, we don't like him at all. But, but there's something about this one, and I don't know. I think the fans have just accepted it. And we know what it is. It's not going to change. And one of the first things that Kirby Smart said after his uh, Vanderbilt uh, press conference 
was basically issuing the fans a challenge. He, he used a, a cheesy acronym. He's using the word elite, uh, which stands for early, loud, intense, tough, and energetic. And that sounds like something you would see maybe on the walls over at Dundrum Mifflin, one of those cheesy motivational posters. But I'm, I'm telling you, this fan base out here in Athens, they've embraced it. They are answering this call. Everybody I know that are perennial uh, tailgaters and season ticket holders, all they're talking about is how they are going to try to light up Sanford Stadium uh, for this noon kickoff. I mean, again, it's just an accepted thing right now. And when Kirby Smart puts a challenge like this out to the fan base, they tend to respond. I think back to G-Day, our, our spring game, back in 2016. It was the very first time uh, that Kirby Smart was going to coach you know, the Georgia Bulldogs for the spring game. And he said about a month prior, he said, I want 93,000 fans in that seat. And the, and the fan base picked up on that. And over 100,000 people showed up uh, to Sanford Stadium. I, I'm not saying that it's that fired up out here in terms of that, that first year of G-Day, but everybody I know is talking about that they are going to do their part and make this atmosphere not feel like noon, feel more like 3.30 or even a night game. And, uh, yeah, Georgia has had some struggles and sort of is, is known to be a little bit sleepy in these early kickoffs, but this one just feels different. So I, I think this game could be played at noon, 3.30 or 7.30, and Sanford Stadium is going to be rocking no matter what this week. Well, Logan, you know, just looking at Georgia themselves, we know how good they were preseason ranked, and everyone thought that this might be the year they finally get to the college football playoff and win a national championship, and still might happen. But it's kind of interesting because obviously that Clemson game at the beginning of the year seemed like a great win, but now Clemson doesn't look like they're that great of a football team. You just got done scoring a billion points on Vanderbilt. South Carolina, you took care of business. So just right now, how good is Georgia? We know what the expectation is, but – do you still believe that what you've seen in four games, all all things are going about as well as you thought they would, and they're still right there as far as contending for a national championship? I, I think defensively, John, this might be in my lifetime. Uh, for, for record, I'm 38 years old, born in 1983. So, yes, I was born after Herschel Walker ran things in Athens and all those junkyard dog days. But in my lifetime, and I, I, this is a bold statement, but I'll say it, I think this is the best defense I've ever seen. It, it's just absolutely dominating. Like you mentioned, some of the opponents are not, you know, up to standard par. Uh, the Vanderbilt and, and the UAB, which is a, a good group of five team, but they're not they're not a perennial, you know, challenger by any stretch. And then South Carolina, not exactly its best form right now either. But what we've seen from them and how fast they look on the field, the the dominating front seven. And the biggest question mark we had all offseason was how would the secondary perform? A lot of guys, I think six from last year's roster, wound up getting drafted into the NFL. But that was a big question mark. But they have looked fairly well as, as also. If they, they, they're not you know, the dominating form that you would want them to be. They're, they've gotten gashed a couple of times here and there. South Carolina got them uh, once or twice. But overall, this defense is just absolutely a joy to watch. Offensively, we find out after – the Clemson game, that JT Daniels was actually dealing with an oblique injury he suffered before the Clemson game, and I think that really affected the offensive play calling in addition to a really good front seven on Clemson, and I think Todd Monk and Georgia's offensive coordinator knew that there was going to be very little to no time to get that ball out, so most of the offense against Clemson was behind the line of scrimmage. I think like 15 of JT Daniels' 22 completions uh, we're all behind the line of scrimmage. It was just an odd game plan, but it was enough to get the job done that night. And then defensively, Georgia just played an absolutely stellar game. It's one touchdown coming on a pick six. And and things felt really, really good. I wouldn't read too much. And look, every fan does this. And whether you're the fan of the team or a, a fan of a rival of that team, it, it's four weeks into the season. I don't know if the Clemson win was a mediocre win or if it was a good win or if it winds up being a bad win. But what I do know is that is a really, really good defensive team on Clemson that Georgia was able to do just enough to win. I think the game plan and the challenges that they had and some players missing from that uh, was enough to get what we think is a very, very good win over Clemson. And then the, the dominating fashion the last three weeks has really – I think energized this fan base, energized this town into thinking that this could be a, a very, very good football team right now. With the JT Daniels injury, he actually missed the game against UAB. Right. And uh, the reports are that he's still not 100%. Is this something that he's going to have to deal with throughout the season? Uh, I'm not really hearing much in terms of he's still injured right now. I, I think he's had some load management since coming back. Uh, there was one possession in South Carolina, and the UAP game was the second game of the season, by the way, which he missed. And 
Then he came back for South Carolina the following week, was looking very, very sharp, throwing the ball downfield with accuracy. And then for some reason, Kirby Smart put Stetson Bennett the backup in for one possession in the second quarter. Bennett immediately threw an interception, and then JT Daniels kind of took over until it was garbage time uh, when you put South Carolina away. And then, and then this past week when it was uh, Vanderbilt, Georgia – came out and scored 35 points in the first quarter. It was an absolute demolishing from the start. And JT Daniels did not take a snap in the second quarter. But I don't think that had anything to do with injury. I think that was just the way Kirby Smart was managing the game and sort of, if you want to call it the gentleman way to win, even though Georgia had a big vendetta over Vanderbilt for kind of canceling his senior night a couple times last year. Uh, But I think Kirby sat JT Daniels. And it could have been more some load manager, but I think it was mainly just you know, sitting him down to put some other guys in because it was already out of hand and when why risk the injury. So I'll say this, based on the people I talked to out here, the sources I have, no one's really talking at all about JT Daniels' injury at this point. And I think we're kind of excited for a game against a team like Arkansas where maybe we can see a good full four, four quarters of a healthy JT Daniels. So far, we haven't seen that. We'll continue our discussion with Logan Booker here in just a second. First, got to tell you about Built Bar. And now for a limited time only, they have a new flavor, the cookie dough chunk, the best one they've had so far. I tried it out. It's fantastic. It's the best one, especially if you're a cookie dough fan like I am. And they also still have all their other nine delicious flavors like coconut, coconut almond, cherry, raspberry, double chocolate, salted caramel. Doesn't matter. They got it all for you. And they're healthy, too, with 17 grams of protein and only 130 calories. Easy, on the go, convenient, whether it's a snack or just something you need to get your energy back up. Built Bar is where it's at. And if you go to BuiltBar.com and use promo code LOCK15, You'll get 15% off your first order using promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily Arkansas Razorbacks podcast. Speaking with Logan Booker of 960, the ref here on Out of Bounds, 103.7 The Buzz. You know, Logan, uh, looking at what's been going on with Arkansas, obviously they've become kind of a darling of college football for a lot of people. And in here in Arkansas, people almost don't know what to do with their hands because how bad <laughs> it's been for so long, but yet things are going so well. Sam Pittman was at Georgia. We've talked about Sam Pittman. Uh, are you surprised by the how quick of a turnaround he has got it going at Arkansas where he took over arguably one of the worst Power 5 programs in the country to now he's got him in the top 10 here in year two? Oh, absolutely. I, I think when, when Sam Pittman was hired, which I can specifically remember the day that he was plucked away from Georgia, it was the day after uh, the Bulldogs got got their backsides handed to them by LSU and Joe Burrow in the SEC championship game. It was in, And then all of a sudden, you know, the playoff chances are done. The season's going to be relegated down to a, a New Year's Six Bowl. It was not a good mood in Georgia or Athens at all. And then all of a sudden we start seeing these reports mid-Sunday about, hey, we're hearing reports. I think Pete Thamel may have been the first one that I saw. Uh, that, yeah, Arkansas is in, in final phases of talking with Sam Pittman. And all of us kind of perk up, like, what do you mean you're going to pluck Sam Pittman from us? Because he is a very, very beloved individual around Athens and Georgia for what he did for the few years he was here. And it was a big surprise to everybody. And then the natural conversation, and, and again, no disrespect, it was, well, what is Arkansas doing hiring a guy in his 50s that has never even been a coordinator before, an offensive line coach out of Georgia? Can Sam Pittman handle that kind of pressure, that, that level of job? And I'll admit that I had some criticism on my show about what I thought he would do at Arkansas, and I didn't think it was very much. So to, so to see 2020, even as weird of a year as it was, to throw a couple, couple good wins out there, and my God, can we talk about – how you guys got absolutely robbed against Auburn last year still upsets me to know in what happened with that game. That should have been a big win. Uh, but then to put some good wins, and now to do what he's doing this year, beating Texas, beating Texas A&M, it is a phenomenal story. We know here in Athens just as well as you do how beloved he is and how good of a coach he can be and how he can relate to his players. I think there is no place on earth that fits him better than Arkansas right now. And I, I'll tell you what, every Georgia fan I know, Every media member that got a chance to talk to Sam Pittman is just over the moon excited for what he's doing. Uh, We certainly hope he doesn't have much success this Saturday, but outside of that, there's a lot of Georgia fans that are very, very happy uh, to root for Arkansas and Sam Pittman right now. How's that offensive line look since Coach Pittman has been gone? We know that Georgia has a lot of talent, and they were able to stack up on that talent while he was there, but are there any noticeable differences with the offensive line? 
I, I think right now, and th- there's an article kind of floating around right now from uh, Dog Nation, one of our affiliates here in Athens, where, where it's a smaller offensive line than we kind of had the last several years. Uh, seems to be a little, maybe slight different philosophy under Matt Luke and Todd Munkin, what he wants to do offensively with more passing the ball. Um, there have been a little bit of struggles. If there were some criticism to hand out for Georgia right now the first four games, uh, the run blocking has not been on an elite level. It has certainly been good, and Georgia has a stable of running backs that I think everybody in the nation would trade in a heartbeat to get in their, in their room. Uh, but there has been a little bit of issue with some, some run blocking. There was a couple times against Clemson where they just didn't get the push, and that's a good defense. But there was a fourth down in the red zone against Vanderbilt uh, this past Saturday where a lot of fans kind of perked up and said, hey, why, why can't we move the ball here? They did not convert a fourth down. Uh, it seems to be a bit of a work in progress. There is a lot of talent there. A lot of it is very young. Um, a lot of it is kind of figuring out where exactly it, it, it needs to fit in the scheme. It did not help that one of our five-star kids, Tate Ratledge, uh, broke his foot. I think it was the third play of the game against Clemson. He's out for the season, and he was really, really coming on strong in that guard position. So that really stunk having him uh, go out so early. But it is a very good offensive line, and I think Matt Luke has done a phenomenal job recruiting almost, maybe not quite as, but almost to the level of Sam Pittman when he was here. But, yeah, if there was one criticism, something maybe that uh, Arkansas would like to exploit, it would be trying to force Georgia to run the ball uh, because that has been a little bit of a struggle this year so far. But I'd say overall that the offensive line is still still quite talented top to bottom. Now, Logan, I'm sure that you and everybody there in Georgia are expecting to win this weekend. We know it's going to be a good game and all that, and it's an intri- intriguing matchup. But uh, the expectation is there. Do you feel like, though, that this game is going to be as low scoring as what a lot of people think? Because I think Vegas has like the over-under set at like 40-some-odd points. I uh, know that Georgia's like 18-and-a-half point favorites in this game, so obviously Vegas favors Georgia heavily there. But do you see this game being a blowout? Do you see Georgia winning by three possessions? Or could you see this coming down to the fourth quarter, maybe whoever has the ball last? I, I, could, I could definitely see it coming maybe into the fourth quarter with, with both teams having a chance. And you're right, and, I, and I'll admit this live on your show. Yeah, we're Georgia homers here. We love our team. We do expect uh, the Bulldogs to win this thing. But uh, that 18-point line, we have a contest on our morning show uh, that, that specifically deals with some of the lines out there. We have uh, some listeners pick some games. And I've kind of been making the joke this week that I would not touch Georgia in that 18 points. Could it happen? Absolutely. But – uh, that that seems a, a little high to me for, for Arkansas to be on such a roll right now and Georgia certainly having a, a moment or two where they have shown that they're not as explosive, I think, as Todd Munkin and Kirby Smart wants to be. We'll, we'll see more with healthy JT Daniels, but eight, 18 points seems a little bit high. I could very much, John, see this thing going into late third, early fourth quarter with both teams feeling that they have a chance to win. If, if I wanted to give my honest-to-goodness prediction here, I'm not sure that, that Arkansas has faced a front seven like Georgia has. I mean, I know they haven't faced one like Georgia has right now with Jordan Davis and these guys up the middle and these linebackers. I think Georgia's going to do everything it can to take the run game away from Arkansas and make Arkansas throw the ball all over the place, which we've seen Arkansas can do. And if Arkansas can hit on a couple of those deep balls like, like South Carolina did, this thing very well could stay close, but... I don't know. That 18 number seems a little high to me. I could see this if Georgia does win like we hope they do. I could see it being more like a maybe a 12 or 14 point margin instead. Logan, we got about a minute left. Who are some of the playmakers we can look out for offensively for Georgia? So there's a big, big, and I, I, I use that pun intended. Darnell Washington is coming back this week, and he is a very, very solid uh, tight end, six foot seven, 265 pounds. He uh, broke a bone in his foot mid camp. Uh, he, he, Kirby Smart said that he will be back this week. But I'll tell you what, freshman tight end Brock Bowers. He was the SEC freshman of the week this past week, three touchdowns against Vanderbilt. He is leading Georgia in receptions, leading Georgia in yards, leading Georgia in touchdowns. Seems to be the favorite of uh, J.C. Daniels and Stetson Bennett when he's in. This kid just looks like an all-American tight end as a true freshman. We're all kind of blown away with just how good he's been so far. So, uh, the thing that we're talking about a lot this week here in Athens is the possibility of having both Brock Bowers and Darnell Washington on the field at the same time because that could be an absolute nightmare for any defensive coordinator. So we're keeping our eye on that. All right, last one before I let you get out of here real quick, Logan. For Razorback fans that are making the trip to Athens, what do they need to do? Yeah, Give them some suggestions. Where do they need to go? 
I'll tell you what, man, we're very proud of this fact that Georgia or downtown Athens has more bars per capita than anywhere else in America. <laughs> Just get downtown. Uh, Clayton Street is the main uh, sort of strip in downtown, and just look in every direction. I promise you'll find plenty to do. Your guys are going to have a great time. I can't wait to see you here, John. I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah, it's going to be awesome, man, just to see it all plays out. Logan Booker of 960, the ref. Appreciate it, Logan, as always, man. Have a great uh, great week, and we'll be seeing it in Athens, man, on Saturday. I'm looking forward to it. You, see you guys later. Well, appreciate everybody listening in to Locked On Razor X podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at BuzzJohnNeighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily Arkansas Razorbacks podcast.